Welcome back to I Care for Your Brain with board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Karen Sullivan. Today we are going to talk about biomarkers and genetic testing in Alzheimer's disease. These things are going to come up a lot more because of the recent approval of the amyloid clearing monoclonal infusion therapy, specifically Lakembi and Kisunwa. It is increasingly important that you, the public, understand what these tests are, why you might need them, and how to advocate for getting them. So first thing we're going to talk about are biomarker tests. What is a biomarker test? This is providing objective evidence of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease in the brain, specifically beta amyloid plaques and tau tangles. What we're really looking for in terms of optimal treatment is identifying them before or during the beginning symptomatic stages. So the common tests here are amyloid PET scans, CSF testing, this is cerebral spinal fluid lumbar puncture testing, and there actually is a new blood test. So if you are going to qualify to get any of these new amyloid clearing infusion drugs, you have to clinically show that you have the memory, language, and functional changes that go along with Alzheimer's disease. And part of that is you need a positive biomarker study. So we used to typically do lumbar punctures, but of course, you know, a little bit invasive, who wants to uh, get involved with that if you could get a brain scan instead. So now we are moving more towards people getting an amyloid PET scan. So this is a specialized brain imaging scan that identifies the buildup of amyloid in the brain. Typically, insurance carriers are covering one per lifetime. So you get one, you know you've got the buildup of amyloid, okay, you've got objective Alzheimer's disease, now you are qualified to get one of the new infusion drugs. We still do the lumbar punctures, the CSF testing. This also measures levels of amyloid beta and tau proteins in the cerebral spinal fluid. Interestingly, you might think you're looking for an abundance of amyloid in the spinal fluid, but actually you're looking for a decrease in amyloid because it's building up and getting held in the brain and not getting cleaved and cleared out. Um, so when you get the lab test back, you're basically looking at an increase in tau and a decrease in amyloid. The other thing is the blood test. This is what we call the ATN profile. This is a fully blood-based biomarker test that simultaneously measures three key indicators associated with Alzheimer's. The first one is that amyloid. Second one is the tau. And the third one is neurofilament light chain. So basically the A is amyloid, T is tau, N is neurodegeneration. That last one there measures neuronal loss, neuronal damage. And primary care doctors and neurologists are able to offer all three of these. But you have to go in saying that I want these tests or your provider has to be educated enough and have a local connection for lab studies to be able to realistically order them for you. What I want you to know, though, is why should somebody get something like this? Well, they don't stand alone in terms of a diagnosis. It's really not clinically a great idea to just offer people these without the cognitive testing, the clinical interview, the functional uh, screen, how's driving going, how's complex finances going, can you remember to take your medications, um, are you depressed, how's your medication side effects. We don't want to exclusively develop a system where people are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease just based on biomarkers because there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between structural changes in the brain and functional changes. This is something that we've known for 25, 30 years now that about a quarter of people who die in an autopsy have plaques and tangles in their brain did not exhibit clinically impaired memory or language abilities while living. Just because you have the pathology of Alzheimer's in the brain doesn't mean that you're actually going to express it in everyday life. You're not gonna necessarily have anything less than age appropriate memory loss. So we don't wanna just use these biomarker studies as standalones. We really want them to be in relationship with a neuropsychological evaluation where we spend an hour getting to know people through a standardized interview where we can assess all things from do you have a history of a learning disability all the way up to what's your concussion history to um, you know, what's your family history of Alzheimer's disease. There's so many different factors that 
really have to go into an integrated understanding of someone's risk for Alzheimer's. We don't want to get into a model of care where we just offer somebody a blood test or an amyloid PET scan test. People who should receive these are people who are being evaluated for the disease modifying infusion treatment studies. I would also say they would be a good idea if after neuropsychological testing, it was unclear if somebody was having a mixed dementia and it was going to determine treatment. We don't want to do tests just to do tests, just to satisfy the intellectual curiosity of a medical provider or even us as, as patients, because it really must be for a purpose. And the purpose can be, okay, none of the treatments that are FDA approved are actually going to help the person. That is a bona fide uh, justifiable reason, but we don't we don't want to go into extensive testing without having a clear idea of if the results are this, that is going to determine treatment will be X or Y. I also want to talk to you about genetic testing. So this is for Alzheimer's disease APOE testing, and this is going to tell you what your status is of any E4 allele. So this is going to determine your relative lifetime risk of developing Alzheimer's. So this is also requested prior to starting the infusion therapies because it is going to give you, it's gonna stratify your risk of having the most significant side effect from the infusion drugs, which is called ARIA, amyloid related imaging abnormalities, basically micro to not so micro bleeds in the brain. We want people to understand that you inherit two alleles from each parent and the uh, combination of those alleles is what tells you your relative risk. So a 4-4 combination is considered to be the highest risk. Doesn't mean you're inevitably going to get Alzheimer's, but it does mean that you're at the highest risk also for this aria. One thing I want you to know about getting genetically tested for Alzheimer's is that you should be doing it within a system that gives you some genetic counseling. There are possible psychological implications to finding out what your relative risk is. Yes, it would be wonderful if everybody found out they were at a nil or a reduced risk. There are some protective allele combinations that you have a lower than average risk of getting Alzheimer's. But what if you came back with a 4-4? How are you gonna handle that alone at two in the morning on your portal, seeing those data points staring back at you? So I really want you to do it within a system where someone's gonna tell you what are the possible outcomes and be there with you human to human telling you what your results mean. This is another great example of why I'm not so sure the portal is doing us many favors in terms of health-related anxiety. Not probably the best to get difficult health news all alone without having access to a medical provider. So those are the two things I wanted to tell you today as it relates to Alzheimer's care, and I hope you found it interesting and helpful. Thanks, bye. <laughs>